If you have your Bibles today, I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings, and we're going to start in chapter 13. And I'm so excited today because after the message today, we'll be dedicating um, Rhett today. I'm really excited. We had prayer over Rhett a couple, and I, and I tell everybody about this. We had prayer over Rhett a couple months ago in October, and, and I'll never forget getting that text message. Courtney got a text message that said, listen, they're saying Rhett's a lot better now. And I was so excited about that, and I'm so excited that we get a chance today to dedicate him back to God. But before we do that, if you have your Bibles, as I said, turn to 2 Kings chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 14. It said, Now Elisha had fallen sick of his sickness, wherefore he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him, and wept over his face, and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bows and arrows. And he took unto him bows and arrows. Verse 16 says, And he said to the king of Israel, Put thy hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hand upon the king's hand. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's de deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote tri thrice and straight. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest smitten fit five or six times. Thou hast thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of Moabites invited the land at the coming end of the year. As many of you know, on Wednesday, is we're going to be going into a new year, 2014. I'll never forget, you know, going into a new year is kind of scary. You don't know what the year's coming, and I'll never forget... Back when, in 1999, when everybody had stored water and, and food because they thought at, when it turned 2000 that everything was going to shut off. And there were people that were scared that the money machines would start throwing money out and, and all this different kinds of stuff. And nothing ever happened. But you know, as I go into 2014, I like to reminisce on what we've done during 2013. And I'm not talking about we as Restoration Chapel. I'm talking about we as the guidance of God upon us. Listen, church, if you ever look back and look at the accomplishments in your life, I want you to realize that if it wasn't for God, you would never receive what you had. If it wasn't for Him, you would never get to the place that you need to be. And as I thought about 2013, I thought about the two great revivals we had here. And the programs that have brought families in. And the ministries that have gotten stronger. And events such as Restored that show that we are Jesus-centered, spirit-led, and community-minded. But then I got to thinking about 2014. And I want to let you know, church. God has greater things in store. God has greater things. Things in store, not for just this church, but for you, for your life, for your family. As long as you go ahead before you even get to 2014 and say, God, this is the year I'm staying close to you. This is the year that I am growing. This is the year that I am stepping out by faith. And say, God, wherever you go, I will follow. Wherever you send me, I will go. <clears throat> That's the way we need to look at 2014. As I was praying, God led me to the text that we just read in 2 Kings. You see, we have Elisha who was mentored by Elijah. And he was coming down to his last breath. And during this time, as a prophet... He was a great mercy to Israel and especially to the sons of the prophets because he continued to be a burning and shining light for all the kings. 
And at this time, King Joash comes and visits him. And the Bible even says he wept over him. You see, the king had heard of Elisha's sickness. And he came to visit him to receive his dying cancel and blessing. And he also knew there was a battle coming up. Church, I want to let you know, in 2014, there will be a battle. Amen. There will be a fight. There will be something that comes against you that has never come against you before. And church, I want to let you know, it is time that we start going to God and saying, you know what? I need your counsel. I need your guidance. I need your deliverance. Because it's not about what Dr. Phil says or what Oprah says or what any doctor says. But it's about what God has in store for you. And I've heard this many, many times. You know, great trials brings great blessings. Great fears brings great opportunities. As long as we rely on God. Amen. Rely on God. That's what Jesus centered is all about. That's what spirit led is all about. We must continue to rely on God. I've asked you this many, many times, and I still think we got a ways to go. But we need to be a church of faith. We need to have faith that God is going to do something great inside of us. I'm tired of down and out Christians. Y'all can be quiet today, that's fine. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of Christians think that the worst is yet to come. I'm tired of Christians sitting back and watching news programs and sitting back and saying, well, God's coming back anytime. You know what? God has given us signs and wonders to let us know that he's coming back. But church, I want to let you know this. That does not mean you sit down all day long and do nothing. That means you step up and do greater things for him. There are still lost souls. Amen. They're still growing. We must do. Elisha then gives the king something to do. The first thing he tells him is to shoot an arrow, arrow towards Syria. But not by himself, but with Elisha's hand on the bow. You see, Elisha was to signify that in, that in all his exceptions against the Syrians, he must look up to God for direction and strength. And the king must realize that his own hands are not good enough, but God's hands are better than anything that we have. Listen, church. I can't grow this church. I can't do nothing for you. But when through God, he can use me as an instrument for him. Listen, church, if you're a Sunday school teacher here, I want to let you know this. It is time that we get back to praying to God for our Sunday school classes and asking him, use me, oh God. Use me, God. I'm tired of sitting back doing nothing anymore. God, use me. Told the king, take the bow. And you know the king had used the bow before. He was probably a king of battles and, and he had the best of best. But then you had this prophet who's fixing to die, take his hands and put it on the king's hands. And he said, you know what? Even in my worst times, through the Spirit of God, you will be a conqueror. You won't be just a conqueror. You'll be more than a conqueror. Church, I want you to realize, even when Jesus was down to his last breath, he was letting people know, I am doing this for you. There's a song that the youth sing. It says, I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God never will. Amen. Church, we need to get back to that. Elisha knew that it had to be through God's hands. How great would it be if you would just let God guide your battle instead of you doing it yourself? But the next part that Elisha tells the king is the one that's the most interesting to me. In verse 18, Elisha told him to take the arrows and strike them on the ground. 
You see, Elisha, in God's name, assured him of the victory over the Syrians. But he will not try him and see what improvements he will make of his victories and whether he would push them on more zeal. You see, the king picks up the arrows. He picks up the arrow. And I want to let you know this. It is hard to strike the ground when you're standing up. So I can imagine this king on his knees. And he said, strike the ground. And the king struck it three times and got up and said, okay, I'm done. He says, Elisha got mad. He said, listen, why didn't you just keep striking the ground? Why didn't you just keep going? Keep going until the victory's done. Keep striking the ground. Elisha got so upset with him. And, he, and, he, and finally we see that he even gets so upset, he tells him, listen, you should have kept going. You should have kept doing it until you conquered it. Why did you only do it three times? Why didn't you do it five or six? Yeah, church, I want to let you know, we know the battle is won through God. But God says we are more than conquerors. So you know what? Let's not just win the battle. Let's defeat the enemy. Let's trounce them. Let's get to a point where we say it had to be God. It was nobody else but Him. Today I want us to realize that when we stop too soon, a lot can happen. You see, as Christians, we can look at the past, 2013, and say, man, what a great year it was. And then we try to coast into the new year. But this morning, I want us to look at three things that will take place if we stop too soon. You see, when we stop too soon, first, our spiritual growth stops. 2 Peter 3 and 18 says, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Which means God's will is for us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Church, I've told you this many, many times, and I'll tell you again. If you're not growing, you're dying. Amen. Amen. If you're not growing spiritually, you're going farther away from him. Church, when we stop pounding the ground, when we stop praying to God, when we stop reading His Word, when we stop being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when we stop having people give their lives to God, guess what, church? We are falling more and more away from Him because He has not called us to be pew sinners. He has called us to grow in His grace and His knowledge. Amen. We must pound the ground. We must take the arrow and hit the ground, smite the ground. Yet many Christians stop too soon. You see, as a Christian, our goal is to become more like Christ or to grow in godliness, righteousness, optimism, and the Word of God. Yet many Christians stop too soon and just like the king, strike feebly half-hearted blows and accomplish so little when so much more could have been done. I'm just going to throw this out here. If you're a leader in this church, I'm sorry, but this needs to be said. If you are not excited about what God's about to do, you might want to step down from being a leader. <coughs> if you're a member of this church and not excited about this church, you just better get excited. Amen. Amen. <laughs> My wife just looked at me with that look. Woo! <laughs> Listen, church. If you can't get excited about God, then it's time to find a place where you can get excited. Amen. Amen. If you can't tell your friends how much God has done for you, then maybe you need to get closer to Him. If you can't go to the altar, we sing the song, Praise God! Praise God! And I know the repetitiveness is all kind of crazy. And I look at Sal over here. And he tripped me out this morning. He was yelling it to the top of his lungs. He, he wasn't even singing it. He was just yelling, praise God. Praise God. And you know what hit me? If some of us Christians would just start praising him like that, how much more we would grow in him. Let's get excited about what God's going to do. He's going to do greater things in us. Praise God. I don't like being around a Debbie Downer. 
Dave Debbie, I'm sorry. <laughs> because when you run a Debbie down, you know what happens, everybody else gets down too. And you know what, church? There are too many Christians that are down because they think they're defeated, but they don't realize all you gotta do is keep hitting the ground. You keep hitting the ground. You keep saying, God, the victory is going to be won. I keep striking the ground. I keep growing closer to you. I keep praying for my family. I keep praying for my children. I keep praying for my co-workers. I keep praying for, for this church to be on fire again. I'm inviting all my friends. I've been telling all the people around me because I know God is going to do something great inside of me. Stop half hearted. The Bible says, you either hot or you cold. Some of you are singing the song right now. I'm sorry, it's in your mind. Some of y'all have a clue what I'm talking about, but that's okay. You either hot or you're cold. But if you lukewarm, he said, I will spit you out of my mouth. And trust me, you don't spit good stuff out of your mouth. You spit bad stuff out of your mouth. And church, I hate to know that the flavor that's inside of me makes Jesus sick to his stomach. Amen. When we stop too soon, we stop our spiritual growth. There are many times that we are lacking a great faith. In a great God who will never fail us. And what we need is zeal, enthusiasm, dedication, commitment, not to stand still anymore, but to keep moving forward and upward to higher heights. In Hebrews 5, 12 and 14, God talks about a Christian that is lacking these qualities. He says, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unsealed in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Church, I want to let you know, if you call yourself a Christian and you not get deeper in the word, you are a babe on milk. Amen. You'll never grow. Amen. My child, he loves some milk. We go about two and a half gallons a week. I ain't kidding, church. You go to my house, there's about three gallon, gallon jugs of milk in my, in my refrigerator right now. He'll go through it so quick. But you know what? I realized, you know, it's going to take a little bit more for him to grow. Maybe it's time we have to up the meat a little bit, even if we have to pour ranch all over it. <laughs> we have to up the meat a little bit we have to up the potatoes a little bit church I want to let you know and I thank God for men like brother Jesse who don't just sit back and say hey I want the bare minimum but I want the deepness of God in my life I want to get deeper in him I want to know more about him and you know what's so funny he don't stop there because you know what he does he brings it out to everybody else he sees and say guess what I just don't want the deepness but I want to give everybody the meat that God has given me church if we would realize that when we stop moving then we are going to die then we got to realize we got to keep banging the ground and say, God, I want more and more and more of you. Amen. I want more of you. The second thing, when we stop too soon, souls will be lost. See, after the king stopped, his nation quickly went down. You see, they won the battle, but there were souls that were lost. You see, when we stop too soon, we must realize that there are people out there that are watching our example and following in our footsteps. Following in our footsteps. Church, you're being watched as a Christian. You know how I know that? Because one guy with a beard that claims to know Christ says one little thing and the whole world goes crazy over it. 
That means everything you say, everything you do will be multiplied because you call yourself a child of God. And you know what that means, church? We can't stop now. we got to keep going because when we mess up, it hurts the people around us also. Amen. Souls will be lost. We can't stop because there's too many souls at stake. I know we've mentioned this before. In Winston alone, there's 3,000 and some people, and only 48% of them claim to be a part of a church. That means 52% of the people of Winston does not claim to be a part of a church. That means that means 52% of those people are not actively worshiping God at a place or a setting. Church, that means 52% of the people could be lost and dying. And you know what we do? We sit back and say, oh, praise Jesus, I'm here. Don't stop. Don't stop. Pastor Peter and I have talked about the outreach ministry here. We can't stop doing what we're doing. I have brother, uh, Pastor Jeff in the student ministry. We can't stop what we're doing. The women's ministry, the men's ministry, we can't stop what we're doing. The seniors ministry, we can't stop what we're doing. Because if we stop, then there could be a soul that we miss. Amen. Oh, Jesus. The last reason why we can't stop. Because the cause of Christ will be hindered. You see, look at the disgrace and humiliation that the king brought upon Israel. In verse 20, we see that the Moabs would invade the land and then other nations would oppose and trouble them. You see, when we stop too soon, the church goes backward instead of forward. Amen. We find ourselves in survival mode instead of growing as we should. And Satan is there to destroy us. A great example of someone who did not stop is Nehemiah. In Nehemiah 2 and 17 it says, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burdened with fire. Come and let us build up the walls of Jerusalem, that we be no more approached. You see, he saw a job, and he knew that the walls had to be rebuilt. He knew there was something that he had to do, and he knew that God's people must get back to work. Back to work. I'm going to try something. Brother Jackie, can you come up here for a second, Brother Jackie? There's some people here that I look to as elders of this church and not, I'm not saying they're old, Brother Jackie. <laughs> Brother Jackie, Sister Myrtle, Sister Marilyn. Some of them have been through hard times and good times at Restoration Chapel. But you know what I've seen? People like that have pounded the ground. Go ahead and strike the ground, Brother Jackie. Don't stop. Don't stop. And they're just striking the ground. And they're just saying, God, you know what? I, 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 I've been here. I put my life in it. You've done so much to me already. I'm just going to keep pounding the ground. I'm just going to keep pounding the ground. Shorty, come here. Uh, Michael, come here. Come here, Michael. I've seen this kid. Go ahead, just start pounding. You know what I'm about to do. Go ahead. Well, I've seen this kid right here for the last six or seven years. And, and I, I've seen where he's come from and what he's gone out of. But I see him every day trying to pound the ground. He's praying for the lost. He, he, he takes his Bible. With, they say, you can't bring Jesus in school. This kid right here will bring his Bible to school before you know it. Yeah. He's taking it with him. I'm not pinning any roses on Brother Jackie or Brother, Brother Michael, but I do know they are pounding the ground. They constantly keep going after God. They keep moving. They keep moving. Brother Peter, come here, Brother Peter. Pastor Jeff, I know I got stuff for you, but come on up here. Come on up here. Listen, we got two great lay ministers that have been praying and working in ministries. I only got one arrow, but that means y'all can pound it even harder. Go ahead. And, and you know what? They sit there, and every day they pray over the ministries that they're over. They pray over the, the, the group of people that they're over. They are pounding the ground. Some of you in here have children that are not saved. It is time to start pounding the ground. It is time to start taking the arrow and hitting it because you know God's got the victory. Some of you are having financial issues. Pound the ground some more. 
Keep on going. Keep on going. Some of you are having uh, marriage issues. You know what? Just pound it. Grab your husband. Grab your wife. And you pound the girl together. You just keep on moving. And you get on your knees and say, God, the battle is yours. We give it to you. We pound the ground for you. We're about to dedicate this young child. I bet you money there's going to be times that Valerie's going to want to pound, not the ground, but something else. But you know what? If she would just get on her knees and pound the ground and say, God, I give him to you. I give his life to you. So I'm just going to continue to pray because the battle has been won.
Listen, there's nobody sitting in this pew right here. There's nobody sitting beside Brother Sam right here. I'm not calling any of you out, but I, you know what I'm telling you? There's still souls that we need to reach. And you know what, church? When we become full here, we'll start having two services. And when we start having two services, we'll move to three services. And then when we move to three services, we'll just build a building. And we'll just start all over again. And you know what, church? And you say it by me, well, that's numbers. You know what? Numbers are souls. And souls are people that are lost for God. Well, by me, I want a relationship. Well, you know what? Let's have a relationship with the true one, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the Creator, the the Savior, the one that came down and gave his life for us. Yes. Praise God. Praise and then we'll have a relationship with the rest of the body of Christ. We got to keep swinging. Keep swinging. 